Color is a fundamental concept in day-to-day -day life. From the time we're little kids, we learn that apples are red and bananas are yellow. We have this fundamental concept of what color is and how it works. But it turns out that when we use color in visualization, things get a little bit more complicated. In particular, color is amongst the most effective, aesthetic, and engaging elements that we can use to represent data, but it's also one of the most challenging to use effectively. So in this lecture, we're going to go over some of the basic tips for using color well in your visualizations. So I wanna start our discussion of color with a fairly simple example. Here, I have a bar chart, and I wanna distinguish how many different categories of bars do I have? Well, in this case, all my bars are green, so I would assume I probably have one general category of bar that I'm dealing with. I might try and distinguish between different categories by doing something like changing how light or dark the bars are, but it's unclear here, do I just have green bars of different values or do I have different groups of bars? Whereas if I do something a little more drastic, let's say I change my bars such that I have a blue bar, a green bar, and a purple bar, our readers are much more likely to intuit that there are three different categories of bars present. So the way that I'm manipulating color in these different visualizations is going to change the kinds of interpretations and the kinds of takeaways that people draw about our data. And all of this is grounded in three core perceptual properties of color, the hue or what particular name our color is. Is it red? Is it yellow? Is it orange? Think about this as like the color wheel that many of us learned about in art class growing up. We also have the saturation or chroma. Is our color bright and saturate or is it kind of dull and muted? And finally, we have luminance. How light or dark is a particular color? And we can use these three different perceptual properties to intuitively communicate different patterns in our data, in particular grounded in the kinds of data we're dealing with. So if we're dealing with numeric data where there's inherent ordering and inherent magnitude, then we're going to want to use what are called sequential encodings. Sequential encodings, like the set of blues we see on the left here, tend to vary from light to dark, and they intuitively communicate magnitude through how light or dark a particular value is. If we have categorical data, think like dogs, cats, birds, then we're going to want to go ahead and privilege hues. Hues are going to be, again, showing us we have groups of red points or green points or blue points. There's no necessarily inherent ordering to those values, but we do know they're different and we can very quickly find the differences. One special class of encodings that we have is something that is called a diverging encoding. So diverging encodings are going to rely on the light and saturation differences that we see in sequential encodings and also the hue variation we see when we're dealing with different categories of data. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to apply this when we have data that has a natural zero point. So the intuitive way to think about this is temperature. We have values above or below freezing. If we make freezing our central neutral color, we can encode any data that's above freezing in red, below freezing in blue. What this is going to do is it's going to set off two distinct categories in our data and the lightness and the saturation are going to tell us what is the magnitude of the value from that central zero point. So in general, this is a pretty good benchmark for getting you started with choosing the right colors. If we have quantitative data, we use sequential encodings. If we have categorical data, we're going to use categorical encodings. And if we have data with a natural zero point and we care about differences around that zero point, we're going to use diverging encodings. However, I do want to step through some additional properties that you might want to think about when you're choosing effective ways of using color in your data. So the first set of principles I want to talk about is how do we choose good color for our numeric data, for our sequential and diverging color encodings? In general, you want to choose encodings that are what we call perceptually linear. That is the differences we see in the colors correspond to the actual value differences in our data. You want the steps to be naturally ordered as values get larger, we can tell they're getting larger. We want our lightness to be monotonic. That is, our brain is really, really well tuned to trying to make sense of how light or dark something is. So we want that lightness to scale naturally with the values in our data. And if we're using diverging encodings, we want to have a natural zero point. A quick side note, 
all of these practices are heuristic, but I want to just break down each of these in a little more detail to give you a better sense of what I mean by each of these properties or parameters. So when we talk about perceptual linearity, again, the basic idea is that the differences we see in colors should match the differences we see underlying our data. But if we use our good old fashioned red, green, blue, RGB method of expressing color, this is think the hex value that you would put into a typical HTML document, we're actually going to create some pretty significant distortions in the ways that we map our data. For example, here, the two greens that we see on the left are equally distant from the two blues on the right in RGB, though we can perceive that there is a much, much larger difference between the blues and the greens. So we have alternative color spaces like CIE Lab, where our perceptual difference, the difference we see between two colors, should actually match the value difference in our data. So I'm not going to go into the mathematics behind CIE Lab. There's lots of great resources out there for that. Most visualization packages are going to have built in tools that allow you to interpolate values in CIE Lab. But instead, I just want to give you a quick intuition for why this is important. Well, if we say we want to go ahead and create a pair of blues that matches the differences we see in these greens, we can do that in CIA lab by taking the difference between the two greens and adding it to our blue. And what we see here is we can get a set of blues that are very, very similar in color, just like our two greens are very, very similar in color. Likewise, if we say instead we want to create a pair of greens that have the same perceived difference or the same value difference as we see in these two blues on the right, then we can use CIA Lab and we get this light green and dark green, which you can see match the general perceptual relationship between the blues. So what that tells us is that these color spaces are going to allow us to more effectively match the value differences we see in data to the differences we see in color. And designers have used these kinds of color spaces for years as kind of the basis for designing effective ways for representing color. But one quick pro tip when you're thinking about using color is that colors that look good at one scale, so let's say the bar charts we see here, can start to break down as we make our marks smaller or even as we change the kinds of marks that we're using. For example, we can see now that we have this scatter plot, it's much more difficult to distinguish between the different categories of green than when we had our nice wide bar chart. So a quick takeaway, a quick pro tip here is that colors are harder to distinguish as they get smaller. So if you're using smaller marks, you'll want to use encodings that have larger color differences. One other thing when it comes to using color to represent numeric data is we want to make sure our steps are naturally ordered. That is, if I choose any pairs of colors out of my encoding, I should understand which value differences are larger and which are smaller pretty intuitively. Uh, so we typically do this by assigning our darker values to our larger numbers. So here we would assume that this dark bar actually represents the largest value in my data set. Uh, this is related to what is called the dark is more bias. Typically speaking, darker bars are associated with larger values. There is one exception to this, and especially for folks who like to design on darker backgrounds, we also have a related bias that is called opaque is more. So if I have a dark color and I put this on a dark background, people will actually perceive this as being more transparent. And so what that will cause us to do is see the lighter bars as being higher values. So in general, you want to try to choose color encodings that are either mapped such that our darker values are higher, or if you're in a situation where values might appear more opaque, our more opaque values are higher. Another really core property of effective color use for numeric data is that we want to use encodings where our lightness varies monotonically. So what I mean here is that as our values get higher, our lightness changes systematically with the value. We want our points to, if we're dealing with a white background, we want our values to get higher as our colors get darker. So this is one of the reasons that things like the rainbow are something that you should avoid when you're encoding numeric data. I know it seems bright and pretty and engaging, but the rainbow has a number of different perceptual failures that cause people to significantly distort values in their data. 
A few of these you can see here. So for example, I have a heat map on the top on the right here that is using a rainbow color map. And on the bottom, I'm using just a simple light to dark, kind of this nice light gray up to this dark purple. One of the things that you might notice right away when you're looking at this particular rainbow map is you see this almost harsh glowing boundary around the center of the map. And that map is actually faded into more of a soft gradient when we use a sequential encoding. What's happening here is that our brains like to group things. And so when they see greens against blues, they're gonna group the greens together, group the blues together, and instead of seeing the soft faded gradient that actually exists in our data, we're going to see this hard artificial boundary. The other thing that becomes a problem when we're using rainbows is that it violates this idea that lightness should be monotonic. If you actually look at how lightness varies in a rainbow, we start off really dark with these blues and then we get really bright as we go to the yellows and we go back to dark as we go to the reds. And what this means is that if we look at just the lightness profile of the data itself, we have a much harder time both resolving the actual value changes that are going on in our data, our brain just isn't able to get onto some of these fine grain details that exist in our data because the lightness just isn't there to support it. And you'll also notice we've run into situations like this where we have a dark outside and a dark inside, even though these are two extremes of our data. So here we have our blues and our reds. And this is especially problematic for folks who are suffering from color vision deficiencies, who have a form of color blindness, because this violation of lightness means that they may have to rely on hues and their abilities to distinguish hues that aren't as well tuned and that may vary significantly between individuals. So in general, avoiding the rainbow, really good idea. Finally, when we're talking about our diverging encoding, we want to make sure our data has a natural zero point. So you'll notice in the scatter plot on the right here, I have my blues on the left, generally speaking, and I have my red points on the right here, generally speaking. If you look at this scatter plot and you were to shift the values, let's say I just shift the values down a little bit, what happens is that I could actually end up in a situation where it dramatically changed the perceived structure of our data. So for example, here, I think my blues are on the left, my reds are on the right, I get a pretty nice clean division, a nice gradient in my data, but if I were to just shift that center point, that zero point down a little bit, I would get something that looks more like this, where now all of a sudden I have my reds permeating through this entire lower boundary and I only have a smattering of blues up in the right. So now I've created, since I have these kind of categorical distinctions between my reds and my blues, if I don't have a natural zero point, shifting around that zero point can actually artificially introduce more boundaries and more divisions in our data than we wanna see. So those are principles and practices that are helpful for when we're using sequential or diverging encodings. Again, when we're working with numeric data, but what about when we have categorical data? Well, principles of good color choices for categorical encodings are a little bit different. So we generally speaking want our encodings to be distinct. We wanna be able to tell all the different groups that we have in our data. If possible, we want those colors to be semantically meaningful. So the meaning of the data point should match the color that we choose. And we also want our colors to be roughly equally salient. We don't want our eyes to be immediately attracted to one set of colors or another, because that might bias the comparisons that people make and the data that people pay attention to. So to step through each of these in turn, when we talk about distinctness, in categorical data, we want people to very, very quickly be able to find and select four different groups. So for example, here, if I'm only varying lightness, I get this nice subtle color change between my dark green, my mid green, and my light green, but this isn't something that's going to stand out. It's not something that's going to immediately tell me there are different categories here. Whereas if I have my green, my blue, and my purple, my brain is automatically going to say, all right, I got different groups and it's going to cluster these groups based on their similarity. And we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about perception. But for now, just understanding the fact that I want distinct, very easy to detect groups is typically one of the best properties that we can put into our categorical encodings. We also want our data to be semantically meaningful. Uh, Dirty little secret of visualization use is that people almost never read a legend. 
what you will find is that in many applications, people will just rely on their intuition first, and then they'll go back and use the legend later to clarify any misunderstanding or to confirm any hypotheses that they have. So if I were to ask someone what bar represents plums in this particular visualization, most people would hopefully intuitively say, oh, plums are purple, therefore it must be the purple bar. If I instead said, nope, that's wrong, plums are blue, people might get a little bit confused as to what's going on in the data. So trying to align the semantic meaning of the data with the colors that I have in my data is going to be one way of making your visualizations more effective and more intuitive for people to use. Finally, we want our values to be roughly equally salient. When we talk about the ideas in perception, we'll talk a little bit about this idea of pop out, that our eyes are immediately attracted to highly salient targets. And we know that if we make certain values in our visualization highly salient, people will see them and they will start their analysis by looking at them. Well, if I'm dealing with categorical data, this can be a problem. For example, if I have this scatter plot here, my eye might immediately be attracted to these bright red points, which means that every reader is going to pay attention and give more visual weight to these bright red points. Simply put, we know people are going to look at them. We don't know if people are going to look at the blues or the oranges or the reds or the greens. So if we turn down the brightness, and we make each of our points roughly equally salient, we increase the transparency, we kind of mute these red points a little bit, then we find ourselves in a situation where people are more likely to ascribe equal visual weights to all of the different categories in our data. So those are some basic ideas around how do we choose effective color. At the end of the day, these are really more ideas that will help you assess whether or not an encoding is effective. Developing and designing color encodings is really a challenging problem, but there are a wealth of tools for designing colors effectively, ranging from systems like Color Brewer, where you have a whole suite of hand design palettes that were generated by professional designers, to tools like Color Crafter, where you can seed and generate your own representations for sequential data, and Color Gorical, which operates on a similar principle for categorical data to CCC tool, which is a fully featured uh, tool suite for getting in and really manipulating the absolute nitty gritty of your color representations. So I would encourage you to think about playing with these tools and others as you start to think about how might you represent your data effectively using color.